Hi, and welcome to the latest of the Kavli Foundation's Spotlight Live webcasts, which offer a chance to hear from scientists on the cutting edge of discovery. My name is Kellen Tuttle, and for this hangout, we're looking to the sky. If you're a stargazer who dreams about planets and other solar systems, planets that might even harbor other forms of life, here's some exciting news. We're only halfway through 2014, and this year, astronomers have already announced the discovery of more than 700 new planets orbiting other stars. In total, we've discovered more than 1,700 planets and other solar systems, and new, ever more advanced telescopes are working on adding to that count as we speak. So what is this discovery we're revealing about our universe? Here to talk about this are three planet hunters at the forefront of the search. Zachary Berta Thompson is part of a team hunting planets orbiting the closest, smallest stars. Zachary is a member of the MIT Cavalier Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Bruce McIntosh leads a team that recently used a new instrument on the Gemini South Telescope to produce the best ever direct photo of a planet outside our solar system. Bruce is a member of the Cavalier Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, which is based at Stanford University and Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. And we have Marie-Yves No, who is a PhD student at the University of Montreal, who recently uncovered a previously unknown giant planet. It's one of the most unusual exoplanets found to date, with a mass 10 times greater than that of Jupiter, and that orbits its star at 2,000 times the distance that Earth orbits the Sun. By the way, before we begin, let me remind you, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please send it to the Kavli Foundation by email at info at kavlifoundation.org or via Twitter using the hashtag KavliLive. So, Zachary, I'd like to start with you. Sure. Most, most surveys that look for planets in other solar systems look for them orbiting big, bright stars that are easy to see. But you're part of a project that hunts for small planets orbiting nearby very small stars. Um, can you tell us the name of that project and why you're focused on the small? Sure. Um, so, um, so I'm focused on the small because one of the things that I think is most exciting in exoplanets right now is this push towards finding planets that are more and more like Earth. And so that's, in exoplanet speak, that is a small exoplanet. Um, and so to find a small planet, it's a lot easier if you look around a small star. And so um, with our project, our survey, we're looking around the, the very nearby, very small stars to find these. Um, and those small stars in astronomy parlance are called M-dwarfs. Um, this is just the, the, the name that astronomers have given to very small stars. Um, Marie will probably tell us a little bit more about M-dwarfs later on. Um, uh, but anyway, so we're looking for kind of Earth-like planets around M-dwarf stars. And so we call the project the M-Earth project, the MIRTH project. Um, so we, we pronounce it Mirth because, because these planets make us happy. Um, but the, uh, the, the survey is, is, um, has been going on for a number of years now. Um, and we're using just a bunch of tel telescopes out in Arizona um, to monitor a bunch of these, these small stars to look for new transiting exoplanets. Great. Thank you for that introduction. Yep. So now, Bruce, I'd like to turn to you. Um, in just a minute here, I'm going to show everybody the picture that you took. So this is that best ever direct photo of a planet outside our solar system. Um, so I'd love to hear what your reaction was when you saw this. And probably more importantly, you know, what you see in this picture that makes it so exciting. What do you see that someone with a less trained eye, someone like me, you know, can't see? So this, like you're saying, is an image where you're actually seeing the extrasolar planet. Most of the extrasolar planets that have been discovered so far, we don't see the planet. We guess that it's there, infer that it's there based on its effect on the parent star as it makes the parent star wobble or as it blocks out the parent star. And what we've been working on is actually blocking out enough of the light from the star that you can see the planet directly. And that's been done before. There's, depending on how you count, on the order of half a dozen to a dozen imaged extrasolar planets that have been seen by various groups, including the one that, that Marie Eve is going to talk about. What was exciting about this one, this was a, a planet that was previously known that had been seen by other groups, but with the tech, previous generation of technology, it took hours to successfully detect these planets, a hour, couple of hours of pointing the telescope, enormously elaborate image processing to remove the starlight. The new instrument we built, the Gemini Planet Imager on the Gemini South Telescope in Chile, managed to do it in a minute. So the fact that, that rather than having to wait around, we could actually look at it and see, oh yeah, there's a planet in basically raw images rolling off the telescope in a minute was incredibly exciting. Um, the version that you're showing now is, is more than a minute. It's about 30 minutes worth of data stacked and combined. 
the little dot in it is a planet about five to ten times the mass of Jupiter, very young and hot, so we're seeing it shining with leftover energy released when it formed. It's got a temperature of maybe 1,500 or 1,800 degrees. And what was really exciting to me, at least, is not that we could see this planet, which we knew was there, but the new instrument is so sensitive we could have seen this planet if it were ten times fainter or, or three or four times closer to its parent star so that we could start to see systems like our own, planets the size of Jupiter, as close to their star as Jupiter was. And being able to actually make images of planets like that and then get a spectrum, we can tell from this information what that planet is composed of, is really enormously exciting and it should make the direct imaging part, area of extrasolar planets kind of catch up to the, the transit and Doppler techniques that people have been using for longer. Nice. Now, Marie, I'd like to turn to you, um, because you discovered this huge and really unusual planet that's an incredible distance from its star, and you're a PhD student. Um, so I'd love to know what's your secret, um, and also why this discovery is so interesting. Okay, so first, uh, my secret is entirely the team I'm working with. It's a very, very dynamic team who's been working on that topic for a, a, a certain amount of time now, so I'm relying on them. <laughs> but uh, this planet, uh, to find it, uh, we, um, like Zach told you, uh, the small stars are the one around which it's easier to find small planets. But it's also true that it's easier to find uh, big planets uh, around small stars. And um, I can also build on what uh, Bruce was talking about because uh, Bruce was talking about a very uh, new, uh, um, like, new generation instrument, G5, which is awesome and allows to find planets that are super close. But we had a surprise with this planet. Uh, we realized that it was actually possible for some rare system to find planets that are super, super far from their uh, host star. And for these planets, we don't need um, the, the instrument that uh, Bruce is uh, is in charge of. So we can use um, sim like eas easier methods and um, more simple instruments also. So we were really happy we found that planet, which will allow us to understand better exoplanet system in general and also giant exoplanets. Great. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about more about techniques in a second. Um, but first, maybe more general questions. This, this really seems like an amazing time for planet hunters. You know, we're starting to discover Earth-sized planets in, in this habitable zone of the star where maybe liquid water could exist. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to discover very old planets that could possibly support life. Um, and just last week, astronomers announced the discovery of an Earth-like planet in a two-sun system, even. Um, so I'm curious to know what each of you think is the most amazing planetary discovery that we've made so far. Ooh, uh, it's, a, it's a tough question. Um, uh, I guess I'll, so I'll, I'll leap in with my answer. Um, uh, which is, um, I, I really can't pick. I actually can't. And so I think one of the one of the things that I think I've been most excited about in the past few years is the the population is what we what we've seen from the diversity of exoplanets. So singling out any particular one for me is, is really challenging. So so I'll, I'll pick maybe two to represent this. Um, uh, and so one of those is is this planet uh, Kepler 10c, um, which is one that we learned about re very recently. It's a planet that's um, about uh, it's of the mass of Neptune, um, which is you know this big ice giant planet in our own solar system, um, and so it's as much stuff as Neptune, but it's crammed into a very small space. It's very very dense. Um, so it has the we've measured the mass of this planet, we've measured its size, and we can tell that the density of this planet is consistent with it being made almost entirely out of rock. Um, and so that's weird to have a planet that is that big, but it's just a giant ball of rock. Um, and so that's one really weird system. And then there's another really weird system, which is um, less massive than Kepler-10, but much, 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 much bigger. It's very, very, very puffy. Uh, this is Kepler-51b. It's only a few Earth masses, but it's almost the size of Jupiter. Um, and so the fact that there's this huge range of, of planet densities that, that we've, we've discovered now means there's this huge range of compositions out there, which means that these planets have formed in vastly different ways. And so there's just, um, it means that there's a lot left to explore, I guess, in, in learning about uh, planets. So, so I cheated in my answer. Right. <laughs> it's probably the, similar to the answer I would give, which is not to pick out individuals, but just statistics that we're in this era now where there are, as you said, 1,700 planets known. 
and especially coming out of the Kepler mission, a huge number of planets whose size is somewhere between Earth and Neptune in our solar system. And there's really no analogy to these in our solar system, and with the exception of a, a few specialized individuals that Zach mentioned, we have no idea what the heck they're made out of. And so this, this enormous puzzle about how the universe has made systems so different from our own is, is extraordinarily exciting um, as a scientist. I must say um, for, my, for myself that I was always super interested by, of course, Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars. Even though I'm not doing my research on that, I'm always following what's going on in that area of the research because, I don't know, I think it's, it's, it might be one of the most exciting for everyone to, to try to wonder if there's something similar to our system out there. So I was particularly particularly interested by the discovery of uh, Kepler-186f, I think, yeah, uh, which was a very similar uh, planet um, than the Earth, but it's around a super small sm star, right? Um, I, Zach, I think I'm right, right? It's a, it's a yeah, small it's, star. Yeah. Yeah, it's but like it's, a it's interesting because it's in the habitable zone of that star. What we mean by habitable zone is just the range of distance from a star where the water on the surface of the planet can remain liquid. So, of course, the Earth on which we model the definition is in the habitable zone of, this, of the Sun. Uh, and this planet is in the habitable zone of this much smaller star, so it's much closer to the star. And um, it's super uh, motivating for me to uh, learn about the existence of uh, these planets. But I'm following this, this uh, particular area. The other, I may cheat and, and bring up one more, just so giant planets don't get neglected, which is the HR-8799 system, which was the first really good direct image system. It has four planets that are maybe three to five times the size of Jupiter, and you can see them all in a single picture, and we've been wa watching it long enough that we can actually see them orbiting around their parent star and going the way Kepler 500 years ago predicted that planets ought to go. The ones close to the star go fast, the one far away from the star goes slow. That's not a surprise because everybody believed in Kepler's laws, of course, but actually seeing another solar system from the outside, like a computer graphic of our solar system slowly revolving around like clockwork, um, is pretty amazing. Yeah, I do agree with you, Bruce. So that was a major revolution because uh, I think the first discovery of an exoplanet was in the 90s, maybe 92 or 95, depending on what you define as an exoplanet. But um, these were all always, as you said earlier, uh, indirectly detected. So in 2008, when HR 8799 was discovered, the system around the star was discovered. It was it was really amazing for us. Yeah. Great. So now maybe we can turn a little bit to techniques. Um, so Bruce talked a little bit about the direct imaging of stars, which is new and very exciting. I'm sorry, the, the direct imaging of the planets that are going around stars. Um, can you guys tell us a little bit about how else we go about seeing, seeing planets that are in other solar systems? Uh, yeah, sure. So maybe I'll jump in here again because this is this is what I worked on most. Um, are these other methods? Is I, I I know very little about direct imaging um, except that it's <laughs> these really beautiful pictures that I get to look at. Um, so uh, so the technique that I use most often is called the transit technique, and what this relies on is the fact that if you have a planet that's so close to its star that even with a really really beautiful camera, even with GPI, this this like fantastic new instrument. It's so close to the star that you can't pick out the light from that planet next to the big glare of the um, of the star. Um, you have to use some other method, and so um, so what we do is we we watch a star very very carefully, and we look for um, little dips in light um, in the brightness of that star. We measure its brightness, and we look for little dips when a planet is passing in front of that star and blocking a little bit of the star's light. Um, and so this is great because it allows us to see these planets that would otherwise be invisible. Um, but it gives us a little bit more than that, too. It allows us to make these really fundamental measurements about a planet's properties. Um, because we know pretty much how big the star is, if we see how much starlight the planet blocks, that tells us how big the planet is. And so that's a measurement of a planet's size. Um, and then we can um, couple this with other techniques. Um, so particularly, there's the Doppler technique that allows you to measure how much a star is wobbling towards you and away from you. Um, and what that can tell you is whether or not there's a little planet that's tugging on the star and moving and causing it to move towards you and away from you. And so it allows you to measure the mass of a planet, how much, like, you know, how many grams this, this planet weighs. Um, and so with those two numbers, a, a size and a mass, then you can start to calculate the density and learn about the, the properties of a, um, 
of a planet in much more detail um, than you could otherwise. And so that's that's why I like this method, is that it gives you these, these really nice, clean measurements. Let me ask a follow-up question that actually came in from a viewer who wants to know that when you're searching for planets either by this, this light dimming method that you're talking about or the wobbling method, you know, how do you determine that it's one large body or you know, it's two smaller bodies that are, that are having this effect on the star? Um, I guess it's that the, in, it's a very specific shape that we're looking for in the sense that the, the manner in which the star dims and then comes back to its regular brightness is very... Um, that's very easy to predict. Um, just as, like you can calculate it from one circle passing in front of another circle. So it's very simple geometry. If there were two bodies, if there were two planets that were like right next to each other and then passing in front of the star at the same time, um, then you would see two dips. You would see you know, it would be some more complicated structure to the the signal that you're looking for, which is the brightness of the star. And, and so did that's... you see it sometimes, right? Sometimes you can see uh, pla uh, stars with many planets around them, and you see the light coming down, more if it's a bigger planet, less if, if it's a smaller planet. Kepler has a couple of these multiple planet system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so exactly as Marie says, that, the, um, that if you watch a planet, a star over a very long time, um, then you'll see one dip from one planet, and then you'll see another dip from a different planet at a different time, and maybe different sizes. Um, but in terms of if you just watch it over, like, you know, a day, you'll see maybe just the one dip from the one planet at a time. So you, it's, it's pretty easy to separate all of the planets that are um, that could be passing in front of the star. With the, the Doppler technique, it's harder. And in fact, that's one of the problems with disentangling very complicated systems with Doppler measurements, that especially if you have planets whose periods are, are close multiples of each other, one goes around in 60 days, one goes around in 30 days, it's hard to disentangle the signals and sometimes possible to be fooled by, by complicated arrangements. Yeah. yeah. Or, yeah, by the activity of the star itself. <laughs> So we actually we have one more follow-up question from a viewer. And so they want to know that if you're using this transit method, or I guess any of the other ones that you just described, um, it seems like this would only work for systems that are aligned to our view, where the planet actually passes between us and the star. Do you have a rough percentage of what systems are expected to actually align that well, and how many maybe we're not seeing? Uh, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a great question. So the um, so it's true that you're only seeing a tiny fraction of the planets that uh, that are out there in the universe using this um, using this method. Um, and so it depends on what kind of planet you're looking at. If you're looking at a planet like a, a hot Jupiter, so this is something that's um, that orbits a star maybe once every three days or so, um, then it's very close into the star, and the chance that it's lined up so that it blocks the star's light is about like one in ten. And so for every one you see that you know that there are ten out there that. Um, but if you look at a planet more like the Earth around the Sun, then the numbers turn into more about like one out of 200. So for every Earth-like planet around a Sun-like star that you find, um, there are 200 others out there that you have um, you've missed. So yes, you're missing a lot of planets, but you're um, but the ones that you do find are just really, really, really useful. Um, so uh, sometimes we refer to these as like um, uh, you know useful laboratories, because you have everything set up that you can make all the measurements that, that you want to make. Um, but of course, we want to know about all of those other planets that are out there that don't transit. And so that's why you need to use um, these other methods and, and build cameras that can actually detect these, these planets that we can't see. So you've described the ability to learn about a planet's size, its mass, and so its density. What other characteristics can we find out about planets? The other thing one can do is to try to study more about its composition or the composition of its atmosphere, because that's all we see in detail with spectroscopy. And that's done both for transiting and for direct imaging planets, that if you can make an, in the case of imaging, if you could make an image of a planet, you could instead put a scientific instrument, a, instrument, a spectrograph that splits up the light into different wavelengths on top of it, and then look for the wavelengths, chemical sign signatures of different compounds that could be present in its atmosphere. And so we can do this and see evidence of water, although water in this case means extremely superheated steam on these giant very hot planets, carbon monoxide, methane, other elements that might be present. And then the ratios of those can tell you things like the, maybe the history of the planet, how it formed. We think we understand enough about the process and the form planets in our solar system to see that it left a, a chemical signature in the atmosphere of Jupiter, and we can try to look for that same chemical signature in the atmosphere of other planets. And then someday... Guess, yeah. I guess what is really fascinating at, at this stage in the history of exoplanet science is that we have many methods 
and all the methods can uh, help to find um, given planets, like planets that have a certain characteristics, and all the methods bring uh, different uh, information about the, uh, the, the planet. So when we are able to combine uh, different methods, we are able to figure out more about a particular system or about exoplanets in general. So that's what's really um, fun right now in the exoplanet science. Along these lines, we have a question that just came in. Um, the viewer is wondering whether it's possible to detect magnetic fields around exoplanets. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard at the current state of the art, I think, would be an answer. There's experiments you can imagine where you might look for the spectral signatures induced by magnetic fields, but those are very tiny. You might look for variability in the planet. If pl The planets, especially the ones we're seeing with direct imaging, are almost like tiny stars. They're so hot. And magnetic fields in stars can produce complicated activity and flares in their, their um, radiation that they give off. And so there have been a couple of proposals to try and look for that signature in some of the hotter, younger planets. But um, nobody's done it successfully, to my knowledge. And one more follow-up question. Um, this viewer wants to know how close do you think researchers are to finding a planet with molecular oxygen in its atmosphere? Hmm. Proving that it has oxygen is is probably five or ten or twenty years away still. The techniques we use just don't quite have the sensitivity. It's possible that the James Webb Space Telescope for a couple of the transiting planets that people like Zach will discover might be able to see signatures of oxygen-like materials, but failing that, it's really going to take either an enormously giant telescope on the ground or a space telescope beyond even James Webb that's designed especially to do this extrasolar planet detection mission. So, Yeah, I would say that um, uh, with regards specifically to molecular oxygen in a planet's atmosphere, we're like just, you know, in the next decade, we are just barely at the edge of being able to do it. So with the wind at the back, uh, the wind at our backs, maybe we'll be able to do it. If we find the right planet, meaning a planet that's the right size and the right temperature and around like one of the closest very, very, very small stars, so it's very easy to observe, um, then yes, with the, with James Webb Space Telescope or one of the, the big um, ground-based telescopes that are being built, these like 20 to 30 to 40 meter telescopes that are coming online, um, then it's just, I've, you know, I've seen the simulations and you just might be able to do it. Um, but uh, but it's going to be it's going to be a challenge, and so um, so I think one of the things we're, we really need to think about now is, is what we need to do in the next ten years um, to make that a real possibility. And I think I I, I do agree with uh, with my colleagues on that that we are really close to do that in terms of maybe decades. But uh, if the underlying question is uh, will we figure out if life is creating um, a, like a given amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, that is much more tricky and that's not sure that we will um, soon be able to uh, figure out or prove that uh, a quantity of uh, oxygen that we detect in a given planet is really there because there's a living form uh, similar to our own living in on this planet. That would be the time. If chemistry in Mars indicates life, and you can drive there, so let alone uh, <laughs> you could do this with telescopes remotely, it's hard, but but exciting and not impossible. Super exciting, yes, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. So I've actually heard it said by some pretty reputable people that they think that if there's life on other planets, we're really likely to find it within the next ten years. I mean, do you guys agree with that statement? Do you think it's a little bit further out? I would take the no side of that bet against those reputable people. I think it. It really requires everything to be just right, the, the perfect star to be close enough with a transiting planet, which, as we said earlier, requires the geometry to line up just right. Um, and that system that lines up just right has to be close enough that you can get high signal-to-noise measurements with James Webb or with the, the future giant ground-based telescopes. So, so I, would, okay. I would be pessimistic on the 10-year time scale. I think I could be on the optimistic uh, side, but I would agree with Bruce that it, we're maybe not talking about like 10 years. Maybe it's, uh, it's just a way to say that it's coming. It's coming quite soon, and we're getting closer to that, which is super exciting for everybody, and especially people in, in this community. But um, <laughs> this is super optimistic to say that we will find life. And I, I have to add that it does not depend only on us and our capacity to find it. It also depends on what's out there. So we don't know. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll also land on the slightly uh, on the, the optimistic side of this, um, cautiously optimistic. Um, I think it will be really tough, but um, there's one big thing that we do have going in our favor here, um, which is we kind of know what's out there. Um, if you asked this question uh, five years ago, we would say, well, hmm, you know, maybe habitable planets around M dwarf stars are like one in a million. We don't really know. It could be, you know, maybe everyone has well, maybe one in a million. Um, but now we know. Um, so from the, the Kepler mission, um, this, this big NASA mission whose job was to figure out the statistics of close-in planets around, um, uh, around stars in the galaxy, um, thanks to the Kepler mission, we now know that the, the rate of occurrence of habitable planets around uh, M-dwarf stars, small stars, um, is, you know, the numbers keep popping around a little bit, but it's more than one in one out of ten. And it's, it's, you know, it's like 0.1 planets per star, maybe up to 0.5 planets per star um, of planets that are actually in the, uh, what you might call the habitable zone. And so this does really increase our chances, chances for finding a, finding a planet that transits its star so we can study it in lots of detail, um, and it's still close enough that we get enough photons, we get enough light from that star that we can use our telescopes to study its atmosphere in, in enough detail yeah. to at least start to say something about molecular oxygen. But then Reeves' point that whether or not there's molecular oxygen in the atmosphere of a planet, if that corresponds to life on the planet, that's a slightly uh, more complicated question. Uh, I guess, but I think yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. We, can start, we, we can start. What we don't know is whether all these small planets in the M dwarf habitable zones are in fact rocky things that might have thin atmospheres or whether a lot of them are micro-Neptunes. So. so I'll bet you dinner, restaurant of, our cho of the other person's choosing, 10 years, oxygen sector <laughs> at, at, let's say, I'll give you five sigma. So. Okay, all right. Five, uh, five sigma detection of oxygen in a, a rocky planet. Is that your stipulation? It has to be a... Yeah, prefer, I, yeah planet, any planet, I think. Actually, I'd be okay with oxygen. Any planet. Molecular oxygen. All right, I'll take that back. I'll take okay. That back. I'll take the optimistic side because then if we don't have it, we'll have the restaurant. <laughs> So, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I, think, I guess what I meant was, uh, from an astronomic point of view and a technical point of view, uh, I totally agree with all that you said, Zach. But what I meant is, um, from the biological point of view, we don't know. We don't. I mean, we have cues about uh, how life forms on, on the planet and how it evolves. But th this is biology, and for biology, we only have one uh, ecosystem to study, and that's our own. So this is, uh, yeah, I, I would be more, um, this is more speculative from my astronomer point of view. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have another question that came in from a viewer who's curious about technology. Um, they want to know if there's a measurement that you're just dying to make that you aren't able to make right now with, with the current technologies. You know, whether that is finding alien life or maybe it's something else. Um, what, what is the measurement you really want to make that you can't right now? Uh, personally, I want to take a spectra of an Earth-like exoplanet, and that would be made from space. And we don't have these tools on the line. I mean, we might have them, but it's, it's not as close as the James Webb Space Telescope for now. So maybe we will, with the James Webb Space Telescope, find one spe specific type of planet, but I would really like to have a dedicated instrument to do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would. I would agree. I guess that, that, that the measurement that I want to make um, is is the um, is studying the atmosphere of a planet that is something like the Earth, and um, and I want to make that measurement for. I want to be able to make that measurement for two reasons. Uh, one is that I'm just really interested in that measurement by itself. Uh, but the other one is that it's a good target to, to aim for. And even, you know, even if we miss that target, we're doing tons of interesting stuff yes. along the way. Yes. Um, yes. That, the, um, that as we will be studying, you know, maybe we, we can't quite do that, but we can study a planet that's a little bit bigger and a little bit hotter than the Earth. And so that will allow us to teach us, you know, that will teach us a lot about um, how planets work. Um, but um, we still are in this position where a lot of what we know about planets comes from our own solar system. And so, the more we can study individual planets in detail outside our solar system, we'll learn a lot about um, about the diversity of uh, sort of evolutionary histories of planets. Mm -hmm. Bruce, do you want to chime in here, or are you happy with that answer? My, my slightly less 
nearer term, because I don't have quite as much long term as the other two, um, would be in direct imaging, not just to see these young, hot planets radiating in the infrared, but to actually reach the point where we could see a planet like Jupiter in our solar system yes. sitting there reflecting light. It's actually true that no technique we use right now would be expected to detect a planet like Jupiter at a high level of confidence around other solar systems. And so to reach the point where our direct imaging technology lets us block out enough starlight that we could see these Jupiters, which are a billion times fainter than their sun, um, directly would open up a huge piece of planet space that we can't access right now. Yeah. Great. So we have another... Oh, go ahead, please. Okay. Oh, I was just going to ask uh, Bruce like, what that would take in terms of a telescope and a... Either the 30-meter the class telescopes on the ground, or there's a proposal to put a coronagraph on a mission called W First, which was going to mostly do dark energy or something exciting. But, but <laughs> <laughs> NASA was donated larger telescopes by another government agency that it could use for this W First mission, which would give it the ability to start to do direct imaging of mature Jupiter-like or even Neptune-like um, planets around nearby stars if it flies, which... It's, of course, always uncertain in big space missions. Yeah. Great. So here's that viewer question that I was going to ask. Um, so they say, there was a proposal a few years ago to create a spacecraft pair that would act as a giant pinhole camera. This might get true images of some of the closer exoplanets. Do you guys know if this is still happening or if it's been canceled? There's a, a variation on that, I think, which is not a pinhole camera, but what's called an occulter. So if you want to see something bright like a bird flying close to the sun, you hold up your hand and you put a thumb in front of it and you can see the planet, or the bird, excuse me. Yeah, bird. <laughs> so there's a proposal for a um, space version of that, except the thumb is about 50 meters across and the U is a telescope 50,000 kilometers away from it. And that technology could actually produce, with pretty high confidence, images of planets orbiting around a lot of the nearby stars. But it really requires a very dedicated space mission, and it's not obvious that that's going to happen on a 10-year time scale, but it might on a 20. Or maybe it could be merged with this W first mission if the politics yeah. line up right. Um, yeah. I think that's the most promising technology out there right now for doing direct imaging, but it's a decade or two away. Yeah, and very exciting perspective in my point of view, yes. You imagine this big floating thing in space and the spacecraft much farther out in space. It's yeah, it's neat. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome to imagine that this is possible. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we're running out of time at time, so I just have one last question that I'm hoping all three of you can answer. Um, and that's a very general one. I mean, we've talked a little bit about your favorite exoplanets. We've talked a little bit about you know what we've been able to see and techniques to see it. Um, and I'm curious to know from each of you, you know, what is the burning question that we haven't answered yet that you know makes you guys get out of bed in the morning, that makes you get into the office early and, and try to answer it? Wow. Okay, um, I think I, I'm going to jump because I have a very cheesy answer to that question, and it's, is there life out there? Because um, for me, it was the primordial question, and it's still, and I think it will, it will remain like that until the uh, end of my life. And I have professors who are, uh, like, like the people you were talking about earlier, who are really confident we will find life um, in the 10 years uh, uh, scope. I'm not that uh, optimistic, but I still dream I will have a hint of an answer by the time I leave this planet. <laughs> so that's my yeah, that's my motivation. Yeah, I would I would agree with me, Marie, that that is that that in the big picture, that's um, that's the thing that I want to figure out. Um, in the and again on the same time scale, it's a it's a good time to be uh, you know to just be entering the field of exoplanets. Yes. Um, uh, but in the more near term, uh, I guess I want to bite off uh, small pieces of that question. And so one of those one of those pieces that I'm interested in right now is um, kind of what is the boundary between um, a rocky planet like the Earth, a, a, you know, it's something that has Earth, it has rock and oceans and a thin atmosphere around it, and um, planets like Neptune or Jupiter that have these very thick gaseous envelopes around them. Um, and so we're just starting to like get, get clues of where that might be, or if they're you know of, of, of trying to figure out what um, what we can um, what we can use in, in terms of information that we can measure about a planet to tell us whether it is a rocky planet or more of a gaseous planet. Um, and so that's that's one of the questions that I'm really interested in right now, and, and that's and trying to poke at that from as many different quest uh, different directions as possible um, is is the uh, you know this year what I'm really interested. in. 
that's my having the, the two big ones taken already. My <laughs> other question would be how do planetary systems form? That we have this enormous diversity of planetary systems discovered through a wide variety of techniques. And if we're being honest, we have very little consensus idea of how they form. The models that I was taught in graduate school, which is a long time ago, um, for how planets formed really only made our solar system, and they don't do a good job of reproducing the, the populations that we're seeing. And so all of these different handles on understanding the compositions of planets and their orbits and their distribution ought to get our theorist colleagues, we're all observers, um, <laughs> to you know, get their act together and come up with some model that can actually produce these. And in turn, that model should help us answer questions like how likely it is that planets will have gone through a history that would allow them to have life. Yeah. Well, Bruce, Marie, Eve, Zachary, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a lot of fun. Um, thanks, too, to all the viewers who joined us and who asked our, their questions. Um, if you want to see the webcast again or if you want to share it with friends, it'll be available almost immediately on both the Catley Foundation website and on YouTube. And if you want to learn more about future webcasts, please follow the Catley Foundation on Twitter. Our handle is at Catley Foundation. Thanks again for watching. <laughs>